Let's try this. Okay, now, thank you. <laughs> See, you're my assistant. All right, we're going to start with the word of prayer. Uh, dear Christ, loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us together today. It's a cold winter day, uh, but the winds have died down, and we are so excited uh, for today to be with you, to worship you, and thank you for everything that you've done for us. You've protected us, bringing us here safely, and we ask that you're with us uh, throughout this lesson. It's an intense lesson, Lord. There's a lot to it, so please help us to focus, to understand, and even if we don't understand it right now, um, when we need it, please bring it to remembrance. Lord, thank you for everything that you do for us, and thank you for guiding us always, in, and watch over those who are still on their way. In Jesus' holy, wonderful, and merciful name, amen. All right, so we're going to start with the uh, Bible text. It comes from 2 Corinthians 5.10, 2 Corinthians 5.10. So this is an intense verse as it is. So you guys could open it up to 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, for we must, yeah, you saw that, right? So for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Ooh, pretty intense, right? So I'll ask you a question. When you hear the word judgment, what do you guys think of? Court. Court? Okay. How do you feel? Served. <laughs> served. <laughs> served sentence. Good. Anything else? Awkward. Awkward. That's a good, yeah, that's a good feeling. I mean, like, judgment is like, like, you will judge like, about like, what you, yourself, right? So it's going to be like, you know, not a little awkward. A little awkward. Scale. Something that was scale. Scale. Like, you just saw the. the <laughs> say that again? It's like something like judging about their private things. Right? Yeah, sometimes about their private things. Right? It's awkward. Anything else? Guilty if you really did it. Yeah, if you did something wrong, you'll feel guilty, right? Um, do you think it's a scary thing or it's a happy thing or. It's a bit. It's a bit. Like a little bit of shame. Shame, shame, shameful, shameful, a little bit, right? Um, so yeah, so all these feelings, they're kind of negative, right? Anytime we hear the word judgment, um, we it's like, um, but to, but this lesson is if if you're actually covered under Jesus, this is actually a good thing. It's a happy thing. So just think about that and I'll try to walk through it because I know when we think about judgment, we, we are awkward, we're a little bit scared, we're shameful, right? And all these things are correct, right? But if we're under the banner, what we call the banner or the umbrella of Christ, it's a really, really good thing. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, so by the end of the study, we're going to know that it's a great thing and you're going to see the mercy and grace of God. So we're going to start reading. Open your Bibles to first, first, oh, this is the same thing that we just read, right? Oh. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what has done, whether good or bad. So all of us has to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Why do we have to appear in the judge, before the judgment seat of Christ? See if everybody's fairly judged. Good. Anything else? Why do we all have to be judged? So that they know which side you. Oh, good one. Yeah, yeah. To know which side that you're on, right? <laughs> Whether it's good or bad. Um, anything else? It's so nice doing this. It's the shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you guys could think of? What? Why do we, why are we judged? Why do we have to be judged? For what we have done. What we have done, yeah. Whether good or bad, right? Um, think of it this way. In the Bible, it says, all have sinned. 
right? Mm -hmm. And fall short of the glory of God in Romans. It says that. Okay. So all of us are on death row, really, right? Mm -hmm. All of us have sinned. I don't know one person that hasn't sinned, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there has to be a judgment because if God is a good God and they call him a judge, and he's a fair God, right? Mm -hmm. Think of it this way. If somebody was a criminal, they did something really, really bad. If the judge was a fair God, would he just say, no, we don't need to judge you. You could continue doing whatever you're doing, right? Of course, a judge wouldn't do that. If he's a fair God, you have to judge them. And if he's dangerous, you gotta take them off the street because they're gonna do it again and they're gonna hurt somebody else, right? So as a fair God, there has to be a judgment. So we're gonna talk about, we're gonna read some verses about what Jesus says about the judgment, right? So open your Bibles, there's a bunch of verses that I want you guys to read. We're gonna start in the book of John, chapter five. Um, we're gonna read, let's see, one, two, three, four. John chapter five. Yep, John chapter five. Uh, you guys can read two verses at a time, so I mean, you could read 22, 23, show you could read 24, 25, Nozomi, 26, 27, and Shinji, 28, 29, 30. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgments to the Son. And just remember, Jesus is speaking here. Oh. Okay. That all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Okay. Show. Sure. Yeah. Uh, most sure, uh, surely, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, uh, sure, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now it is. When the uh, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and who of uh, those who hear will hear? Okay, I'm in the wrong chapter. Yeah, John five, verse twenty-six. Uh, twenty-six, twenty-seven. Yeah. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have life in Himself, and has given Him authority to execute judgment also, because He is the Son of God. In 28? Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who is with me. Okay, so, um, you know, a lot of people take these verses in the wrong way. They, they get confused. Um, those who did good or did evil, because we just talked about, there's no one that's good, right? All of us are sin. Right, uh, but it says we'll all stand under the bed, but um, but when we stand again under the banner of Jesus or the umbrella of Jesus, uh, I'm not sure if you understand what it means to be clothed in His righteousness. You'll hear that at church all the time, clothed in His righteousness. Do you know what that means? If we stand under the umbrella of Christ, clothed in His righteousness, protected, protected, good. Anything else? Shielded. Shielded. Good. It's clothed in his righteousness. So, so like maybe it can also like define you as like a follower. That, like, a follower? You're, Good. You're uh, like, you're 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 Excellent. Like, that's, like, that's a good one. That you, it, it shows that you're a follower of Christ, right? So um, when it says clothed in his righteousness, it also means, and I didn't know that for a long time either, so don't feel bad if you don't understand it. Clothed in his righteousness means because he died for you, he took your sins away, so you're righteous. Oh. Ah. Oh, okay. So you're covered under his, his righteousness means he died for you. 
So you have no sin. It's all wiped away when you repent and he died for your sins. So all your sins are at the bottom of the ocean and you're clothed under his righteousness. So it says here that um, um, there's no one good, but if you're under the banner of Jesus, clothed in his righteousness, he covers our sins. And if we die before he comes, we're covered, right? In the resurrection, you're covered by his blood and you're saved. Does that make sense? That's what clothed in his righteousness means. Okay. So, but interesting in verse 24, it says, it says here, verse 24, um, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. Didn't it just say that all are judged in that last verse? Yeah. In the last verse, it says all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But this verse says, shall not come under judgment. So just to, that's why people get kind of, you know, some people think, oh yeah, once you're a Christ and we don't get judged and we're good and we're good to go, right? Yeah. And then, so, you know, they do whatever they want to, but that's not what this verse means. So what this means means, with, means is that um, we won't come, it says, so this is English, right? So English, it says, and shall not come into judgment, meaning there's a difference between coming into judgment and be judged. Okay, so this is English class 101. Come into judgment means, okay, Lord, you know what? I know you're giving me eternal life, but you know, I don't need it. I'm gonna save myself. Then you're gonna come into judgment. Right? That means, but if you're yeah. judged, then you are judged. That's the difference, right? So what it's saying here is that um, you shall not come into judgment because you're covered, because you repented. That's what it means. So it's, there's no conflict in it. I know it's a little bit difficult, but just want to clear that up. Okay, another thing Jesus said about the judgment. Turn your Bibles to Matthew. So it's uh, Chloe and Jewel. Do you guys do, want to do some reading? Matthew 12, Matthew 12, 35 to 36. And there's another one next, but uh, one of you guys could do Matthew 12, 35 to 30, 36. Okay. Um, it says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Okay, so this is another intense one. This is the one that I remember. Every idle word that men may speak will, right? They will have to give account of it in the judgment. What does that mean? Every idle word men may speak, they will have to account for it in the day of judgment. Oh, you have to speak about like, what you uh yeah, you got to be careful about what you talk about, right? Or what you say, what comes out of your mouth, right? So um, some people may think that, you know, they're going to be doing something in private and no one knows, like they're doing something on their cell phone or, you know, and whatever, right? And no one's around, so nobody could see. There are angels beside you writing everything down in the book of record and saying, oh my goodness, what did Lily say to her boss last week? Or, you know, what did she say or whatever, right? And then, you know, anything they're putting a record on it, every idle word. So it gives you a different thinking. So when you live your life, right, and it's going to be a journey, I know we're not perfect and we're going to fail. So this shows the mercy of God, right? So every time we, this is why at night it's so important to think about what did I do to, uh, today? Is there anything that I said or did that was contrary to what would make God happy? Right? So when you do that and when you say, oh, I can't believe it. I did this little lie, right? And then say, Lord, please forgive me. I, I got to try better next time. God, he just part of the ocean, right? Angel comes in here, gets an eraser, gone, right? But that's why you have to analyze that night to say, what did I do today? Did I say anything? Did I hit show? 
yeah. really hard, right? <laughs> Did I slap them, right? Or, you know, whatever. No, I'm just kidding. But every idle word made me think, right? God knows, God knows you. He knows everything that's happening around you, right? And this is the book that we're going to be looking at uh, in the millennium, which we're going to talk about later. So we're going to be judged by, you know, what comes out of us, right? And um, re do you remember the sermon that I did a couple weeks ago about eating pork? Is it a uh, sin to eat pork? No. Remember that? Which sermon? Uh, that was uh, not, it's not sin. It's not sin, but what is sin? No. Not following God's word. Not following God's word, right. Exactly. So the sin starts in your heart where actually eating pork isn't the sin. But in your heart, you say, I'm going to eat that, even though God told me not to. That's when sin starts, right? So what comes out of your mouth? It's from the heart. That's what Jesus said, right? So he said, it's not what you put into your mouth, but what comes out of the heart right so when you say things it's actually coming out of your heart so that's what the angels record saying what's really inside your heart is it something mean is it something that's going to hurt somebody is it something right so those things are being recorded so you got to think to say lord i don't remember everything that i did today but if i said anything to hurt someone let me know so i could apologize or if i you know please forgive me help me to do better next time right you got to think about it. you got to ask the lord to forgive you and change you right and he will the holy spirit will help you we can't do it ourselves it's the holy spirit that's going to be helping you do that right um okay so it's basically we will be judged right um on our response to God's love. So when we make a mistake, God wants to throw all of that into the deepest part of the ocean when he asks, when you ask him to forgive you. He's gonna say, yep, he wants to. He can't wait until you say, ah, see, well, Shinji knew that he did something bad and he know, I know his heart, he felt bad about it. He goes, it's gone. And he's so happy about that, right? Because we learn from that. We learn from our mistakes. We're going to make so many mistakes. I'm telling you, I made so many mistakes in my life. And we're going to continue to do that. But God is so merciful, giving us chance after chance after chance to try again to do better. Okay, another verse. Uh, that was Chloe, right? So Jewel, Luke. This one's an interesting one. This is another one that Jesus said about the judgment. And this was a little bit difficult. So let's kind of read that. Luke 11, 31 to 32. Luke 11, 31 to 32. Yep, Jewel, if you have that one. Um, Jewel's in the washroom right now, but I can oh, read okay. it. Yes, please, so go ahead. So Luke 11, 31 to 32. Yeah. It says, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh, Nineveh yep. <laughs> will rise up in this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. All right, so the queen of the south, who is the queen of the south? Who does it say? Wait. Who is the queen of the south? Oh, no. Oh, no, what? Uh, the queen that appears in this. Mm, just keep reading that verse. Who is the queen of the south? Is that from Second Kings or is that from Second Kings? Yes, it is. The Second Kings. Is that? Second Kings. Mm, it kind of does, but same person. Uh, same person. Yeah, same person. Who is that? Please help us. Okay. So the Queen of the South will rise up in judgment. That means she's already dead, right? Going to rise up in judgment, right? with the men of this generation and condemn them. So she's going to judge people, right? For she came from the ends of the, because 
Why is she going to be one of the judges, one of the righteous? Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater Solomon is here. So the queen of Sheba, remember, the queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon and say, you know, I need to, I heard all this stuff about Solomon. I need to hear for myself. So she came from afar along and she, her heart was receptive. And then she started understanding about God and she accepted God, right? So because of that, it says she's going to rise and she's going to be judging all these other people, right? And then here, the next one, the men of Nineveh, what happened in Nineveh? Go. What happened in Nineveh? Yeah, the Jonah story, right? That's what it says right there, right? Jonah goes in and he says, repent or your whole city is going to be destroyed. They repented. So he says, the men of Nineveh is also going to be judges. So all these people who are open to hear the word of God and repent and accept God, accept Christ, you know, they will be a part of the saints in heaven that will be judging all the others. That's what Jesus says. That's what he's saying right here, right? Make sense, right? So um, let's see. The clear message about the judgment is that there's going to be a lot of opportunities to make a choice. So my sermon was about, you have to make a choice. Yeah, not pick a choice. No, pick a side. Pick a side, right? You got to pick a side. You know, don't don't just be in the middle of saying, well, you know, I should do this and I should do that, but you know, uh, I'm just gonna stay lukewarm, not Luke, lukewarm. L U K. Yeah, it is the same spelling. Well, no, L U. Yeah, it is the same spelling. <laughs> lukewarm, right? So don't stay lukewarm. You have to take make an effort. It all. Jesus is also saying that judgment is real, and there is gonna be a righteous judgment. It's coming. No one could escape it, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, they don't want to hear it because, you know, they feel the negative part about judgment. But we as Christians that are under the banner of Christ shouldn't look at it as a bad thing, right? We should look at it as a good thing. Um, could you imagine when we're talking about, we are talking about a perfect judge, a righteous judge. Could you imagine standing before a judge that's not righteous? That is kind of... You know, he prefers Japanese. He prefers Filipinos over, you know, white people. Or he prefers white people over black people. Or he prefers black people over um, Spanish people. Or could you imagine standing before a judge like that? Right? Mm -hmm. He is a righteous judge. He loves everyone with an immeasurable and unfailing love. That is our judge. So we should be happy. Right? He's unbiased, right? So he will judge. What's that? What's that? Seems good. Uh, if you if you don't care about anybody, you would also be unbiased. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Everybody. Excellent. Excellent point. Right. If you don't care about anyone, you know there is. Cold. What would this say? So don't use that up because you're going to need it this afternoon. <laughs> Charge it up. Right. Um. So. I was going to say, there is a saying that, remember the, um, uh, what was that parable where a guy was sick on the side of the road and then two men came? Good Samaritan, thank you, right? It may, you may be righteous, but if you don't do anything to help somebody that's in need, Eat, that's a sin. If you just if you know you could help them and you don't, that's a sin, right? So it's a sin of undoing. So there's that too, right? So, um, so we should be happy because if we're covered, we are, and the word is vindicated, it means that we are saved, we are justified because Christ died for our sins. But make sure that you self-analyze yourself, what you did in the day, and just tell them to say, I don't remember everything I did, but bring it to my remembrance. What did I do wrong today? Right? Be well. The Holy Spirit will show you and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Right? I don't remember everything, but I'm, uh, I don't want to hurt you or go do anything that's against you. That should be our prayer every single night before you go to bed. Right? All right.
Uh, other verses about the day of judgment. Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter seven. Uh, let's see, we're doing that. So it'll be, um, let's see, how many will we read? Okay, you could. Hmm? Do we have shelter on today? Yes. We do. We do. Uh, Daniel 7, I mean, you could read 9 to 10. Show, you could read Psalms 9. Psalms yes. 9, 7 to 8. And then we got Nozomi, you could read Acts 17. Uh, 9, yeah. 7 to 8. 7 and 8. Nozomi, Acts 17, 30 and 31. So, I mean, you could start with Daniel 7, 9 to 10. And we're talking about other references to the final judgment. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days were succeeded. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure gold. His throne was a fiery ring, a fiery ring. Its wheels are burning fire, a fiery stream issue, and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. Okay, so here you see a picture, um, what you were talking about, of a courtroom scene, right? Yeah. The courtroom scene, it's a picture at the end time scene. And the ancient of days, that's our father God. Right? The ancient of days, it says, was seated. His garment was white as snow. Right? And hair of his head was like pure wool. Like soft. Now, I want to touch it. <laughs> right? His throne was a fiery, a fiery flame. Right? It's wheels. So his throne has wheels. I've seen pictures of that. What? Yes. His throne has wheels. And, and did you notice, oh, right? Gosh. Did you notice in Ezekiel, it said a wheel in a wheel in a wheel. I don't know if it's related, but it doesn't mean that the wheels are like this. It could be like this. It could be whatever, right? Is he riding on multiple wheelchairs? He says here, it says right there, right? And his wheels were a burning fire. It could be a fiery, it could be a round ring of fire, right? Oh, okay, now it makes sense. Right? <laughs> Um, so, and then, so, so that's a little bit picture of him. Okay, read Psalms 9, 7, and 8. Psalms 9, 7, and 8. Okay. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared, uh, prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer, uh, administer judgment for the people in the uprighteousness. Okay, and one more, Acts 17, 30, and 31. Mm -hmm. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere, men to everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from them. Okay, so all of these verses, right, talk about judgment. If the whole Bible is talking about a judgment is coming, can you see that the Bible is here to warn people that there's a judgment coming? Right? So the Bible is here saying, did you know that Jesus is, the majority of Jesus's parables and stories, what he talked about, he talked about heaven more than anything. Oh. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, how do you get to heaven? How are you saved? Right? Oh, so, oh okay. Now. It look, the Bible is like a how-to manual. Yeah, how-to yeah. manual, right? To be saved and how-to as a warning of what's going to be happening, right? And I'm saying that because right now, why are so little people talking to other people about judgment? They don't want to talk about judgment when they talk to people. You don't see very many pastors talking about judgment very often. Right? It's, uh, religion. Religion. Also, that sounds like uh, if you don't believe in God, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so fear, right? So we don't want people coming to Christ in fear, right? In good fear, right? But does that mean that we shouldn't be 
does that mean that we shouldn't be preaching about judgment? It should be, but a lot of people are busy talking about the weather. Exactly. A lot of people are just talking about the weather, right? There, people are talking about anything but for good yeah. man. Stand up if you're tired, right? Are you sleepy? Yeah. You're sleepy, okay. yes. I'll, I'll stand up with you. <laughs> okay, there you go. Everybody's standing. Good. Everybody's tired. Okay, so I'm saying that because if we're supposed to be, um, if Christ is our example, shouldn't we do what Jesus did? Okay, so I'm going to tell you one thing, and I did this in a sermon a long time ago. I don't think you guys will remember. There's a thing called friendship evangelism, right? Meaning you befriend them. And, and a lot of people say uh, Christ's method is friendship evangelism. I don't agree with that. I've heard many people, even in our church, say that is Christ's method is a friendship evangelism. Did Christ make many friends? The friendship. They're saying that you, you um, meet them, you spend time with them, you invite them over, you become friends, and eventually they'll see Christ in you and they will convert. Oh, kind of like Catholic. Maybe, maybe Even our church does that. Our church teaches that. Maybe like a lot of times to get like influenced by Yeah, to get influenced by them and things like that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. To I'm not yeah. Too, too much. Yeah, yeah, right. So there's nothing wrong with friendship evangelism, but that's not Christ's method. You know, so don't let anyone tell you that's Christ's method. Christ said he didn't have a pillow to sleep on. He didn't have a place to live. If he didn't have a place to live, how could he make friends? Long-time friends. So if we're using friendship evangelism, how's that going for us? How many people have been, how many, if that's working, our church should be flowing with people. I've had friends, they're not converting, right? Right? If I, they trust me, like people at work, they trust me a lot. I have, you know, um, thank God. Right? I have a lot of, um, because of him, I got a lot of respect from people that I work with. And they know that, you know, um, I believe in God and everything, right? But still, they're not converted yet. I wonder when, why. I wonder why, right? So when Jesus went out, the main thing he said for all of these verses, what he said himself, repent. There's a judgment coming. So I know we don't want to scare people, but is that at a point if somebody is going down, they fell out of a boat or they're swimming somewhere, you know that there's a fall, you know, a waterfall, and they're going towards the waterfall. Do you just say, it's okay. I don't want to scare them. Depending on the person. Depending <laughs> on the person, right? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Right? If they're going towards that fall or they're going towards danger, wouldn't you want to say, hey, listen, just, I want you to know something, you're, you're going into danger, right? It's not forcing them to come to Christ. It's just saying, you know what, by the way, you know, um, there is a judgment coming, right? And there's different ways of uh, saying that to your friends as well too. Mm -hmm. You get them to, of course, you know, uh, we talk about the Bible. Why do you believe in the Bible? We ask these questions, right? Do you believe in the Bible? You don't believe in the Bible? Really? Well, do you know why we believe in the Bible? I said, there's prophecy. There's all these things. All these things have come true. Do you know what? It says there's going to be a judgment, right? And say, I'm, I'm not trying to scare you, but fact is fact. If there's a truck coming for you, doesn't mean that, you know, even if you don't believe that there's in a truck, there's a truck that's coming for you, right? Even oh, you, wow. Right? So... There is always a way of being able to explain it to people, right? That there is a judgment coming. That's what Jesus did. But Jesus was a lot more blunt. He said, repent. Because the judgment is coming. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? He wants everyone to be saved. So sometimes we've got to get bolder in a way to be able to reach people. They may not like what they hear, but they didn't like what Jesus said either. So if Jesus is our example, we're going to get people that don't like what they hear, right? Which is fine. 
you gave them a warning. You know, they can never come back to you. Let's say they never accept Christ and they're rebellious. And then the second coming comes and we're after the millennium, right? The judgment comes for those who rejected him. They're on the other side of the city. They could never look at you and say, why didn't you tell me, right? You could look at them and say, I tried to tell you that you're heading towards the falls, but you didn't want to hear me. You got mad at me, right? But sometimes the little things that you put into their mind, even they, even they don't like it, they're going to think about it. Just because they get angry and they don't want to hear it, it's the seed is planted to say, okay, well, what if there is? What if she's right? What if he's right? You know. So our job is to plant the seeds. Our job is to convert them. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Our job is, this is why the Bible says we need more preachers. Oh, I know it's more shepherds. No, we need more preachers. We need people to speak more. We need people to say more, right? And then to share more, right? That's what the Bible says, okay? So, okay, so this is basically saying that there is a judgment coming and he, God is our, Jesus is our lawyer. He's our judge, the righteous judge, right? And it's funny. It says that things are tipped in our favor, which is pretty cool. So if you're under the umbrella, you should be happy that there's a judgment because you have a righteous judge that's in our favor. So it's like having an uncle who's a judge, right? And then so you're coming up and then you're coming to the court, you go, oh, my favorite uncle, right? He's gonna have a, you know, he's gonna tip in your favor, right? Kind of thing. Uh, it's not completely like that, but anyways. Um, so, Let's see. <laughs> the other thing that God, we know that God is um, a fair judge. Not only does he judge properly, but he's also transparent. Meaning that he will tell you why we did or didn't do something right. Mm -hmm. Or he will tell you why at the end time, why somebody didn't make it or not. You might not see something that you thought, oh man, Lily's going to go to heaven and all of a sudden I'm not there, right? He will show you why. He will be completely transparent to say, she did this or her heart was in the right place or whatever it is. It'll be all written in the books, right? And then he's going to, because he wants you to know how perfect and righteous he is, right? This is the great controversy. He's trying to tell you guys, I'm a fair God. Satan says, no, he's not a fair God. He is a tyrant. You just have to do whatever he tells you or he's going to kill you. That's what he's saying. And Satan's saying, I'm going to be a better God. So follow me. That's what he's saying. You'll have more fun with me. You know, you'll have uh, more money than, you know, if you follow me. I'll give you whatever you want to if you follow me. That's what he's doing. And all God's doing is, I'm a fair God and I'm going to prove it to you. Right, we got one of it. So pick a side, right? That's what he's asking you to do. All right. So there are three stages in the final judgment. Three. I don't know if you guys knew that. Oh, I don't. So. Okay. First thing, do you know? Uh, first one. Apparently, we don't know. All right. That's okay. So this is why we're studying. Uh, the first stage is called the pre-advent judgment. That means that. Um, it's going to happen before Christ comes. So there's a judgment before Christ gets here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to look at some verses to show you about that. Uh, the next two phases. Millennium judgment. And then there's a third. The execution. Yeah, there you second. go. Okay. Second. Okay. That's also on the millennium. Millennium. Well, it's a millennium. Yeah. It's a millennial, but it's in the millennium. Millennium is 1,000 years, right? It's so it's in 1,000 years, but it's millennial judgment. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to look at the pre advent judgment. So let's open our Bibles to, so I think it's Shinji, your turn. Revelation 14, 6 to 7. So where does it in the Bible say that there's going to be a judgment before Jesus comes? Revelation, Revelation 14, 6 to 7. Okay, got it. Okay. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, 
having an everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Okay, so to every saint with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Jesus isn't there yet. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is there. He's the, uh, the angels are saying it's coming, it's coming, but the judgment has come. Right? So at this point, he hasn't been here, but the judgment has come. And we'll and then we'll read later that there's a day appointed that God will judge the world. So this is before Jesus comes. This is the last cry to everyone warning people to say, Jesus is coming. This is your last chance. Right? Okay, the next one. Uh, Chloe, do you want to read Revelation 22, verse 12? And let's see. And Jewel, if you're there, John 5, 28 and 29. Revelation 22, 12. And John 5, 28 and 29. Revelation 22, what? 12. Yeah. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Okay, so if he's coming with a reward, the judgment's done. He already knows who he's going to reward, right? So that's a perfect verse to say there's going to be a judgment before Jesus comes because why would he bring a reward if he doesn't know who's bad or good? The judgment hasn't happened yet. Make sense? Yeah. Right? Okay, John 5, 28 and 29. Okay, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection, resurrection of condemnation. Okay, so again, right? It says those who are in the graves, those who have done uh, good is going to be resurrected in the resurrection of life and those who are bad. That means there was a judgment before Jesus comes. Like, it's so clear. Some people don't believe that, right? They believe later on, you know, there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a judgment before Jesus comes. It's already going to be set. The books are going to be closed, meaning it's done. It's yeah. finished. The people that don't accept them, no more chances. Mm -hmm. So we have the first final cry saying, this is your last warning. And then those after Jesus comes, it's no, no longer, right? Um, let me see, there was another one. Uh, Daniel 7, 9 to 14. I didn't quickly read it. I watched till the thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. It's gone. Oh, we read that. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. So we read that one. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Keep going. So the pre-advent judgment, do you know when this pre-advent judgment started? So when did this judgment start? So if there's a judgment before Jesus comes, do you know when the judgment started? When Jesus came, we'll go to heaven. Yes. Um, like there was a great depression. That's that's when the Jews went on. Is it after? Great uh, depression. Great depression. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I think I'm wrong. I think I'm wrong. That's okay. I'm wrong. That's okay. That's okay. No, it's okay. Uh, you know, this is where we learn. So, um, according to Daniel, according to Daniel chapter fourteen, you know, remember I talked to you about the twenty three hundred. Uh, year prophecy 2300 years you know 490 is here right and then got the 1260 here but the 2300 years this is 1844 so when all the problems finish are 1844 when jesus goes and starts the final judgment in the most holy place that's what we call um that word um i can't remember the name that we call it but that's when the um pre-advent judgment started because it says in Daniel 8, 14, and he said to me for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. So there's 
um, symbolism, of course, right? You guys know about the sanctuary. You know what they did in the sanctuary, right? They, um, whenever somebody sinned, they would bring an animal, they would, right? And they would sacrifice, which all pointed to Jesus, right? So they had the Day of Atonement once a year when throughout the whole year, 365 days, there was blood everywhere for 365 years, blood of all the sins inside the sanctuary. And then once a year, they go in and they clean it all. So there's going, so what they're saying is in the heavenly sanctuary, all the sins are going to start the judgment process of cleaning everything up putting everything in order and understanding. And this is where the pre-judge uh, uh, judgment starts, right? Um, and it will, we were not going to get into how do we know that it's 1844. It's basically when uh, they started to rebuild Jerusalem. That was the start of uh, the 538 AD, I think it was. And then, and then restoring of Jerusalem. Oh, I'm sorry, not AD, BC. And then all the way through to 1844. But anyways, we're not going to read all that. Okay, so um, Daniel 7, 21, 22 says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the ancient of the days came and the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the most high. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So again, in here, it says in favor of the saints, meaning we have the advantage. If you're covered under Christ, we have an advantage because the judgment is in favor of us. This is why I'm saying the judgment shouldn't scare you. You should be happy about the judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Or in it's in favor of the saints, right? So it depends if you're under the banner or not. So again, you've got to make a choice, right? Are you going to be under Christ's banner or not? If you're under Christ's banner, then it's a good thing for judgment, right? If you're not, then, you know, that's a different story, right? Um, so John 5.24, and you don't want to read John 5.24? Most, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and reads in him, who sent me as everlast, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Okay, so we read that a little bit earlier. But how do we come into judgment? How do we not come into judgment, come into judgment? How do we not come into judgment? We're all going to be judged. But how do we not come into judgment according to these verses? How do how are we vindicated? How are we saved? By the blood of Jesus. Excellent, right? He who hears my word and believes in him. You have to believe in him. That means have faith in him. That was um, what my sermon was about. Is you gotta have faith in him. Even if it doesn't make sense, even if you're not sure, just have faith in him, right? Even if, like the weather today, right? I wasn't sure if it's going to be nice or not, right? And just going, oh, look at this weather outside. I'm going to leave it to God, right? He'll tell me. If he wants me to go out, we'll go out, right? And look at it. It's not snowing. It's not blowing. It's cold, but that's winter, right? We're Canadians. We should be able to go out in the winter, right? Oh. Just wear extra clothes. I hope you guys brought extra clothes. And I hope you show you brought extra shoes. Not like I'm, last time. This one? Oh. If no, it were freezing. Boots. All right. So it's by faith. You have to choose to believe in him and have faith in him, right? God has never let you down. If you're here right now and you're listening right now, he hasn't let you down. So if he hasn't let you down up to this point, he's not going to let you down in the future. He knows your life. He knows you better than you know yourself, right? So you have to have faith in him. That's what it's saying. He who hears my voice and believes in him who has sent has everlasting life. you got to believe it. So if you believe in him and you're continually trying, you're not giving up, right? Your prayer, my prayer every night is, Lord, I'm failed, but I will never give up. I'll never give up trying to do better. Help me to do better tomorrow than I did yesterday. Right? I'll never give up. 
that should be your prayer every single day, right? Every single night before you go to bed, right? So um, let's see. The other good thing is, so they're saying, okay, well, are we going to be standing in front of Christ? Like, where does that fit in? If there's a judgment before Jesus comes, how do we stand in front of Christ? Are we going to be physically standing in front of him? Are we going to? That was a that was a really good question. Jeff actually gave me that question years ago, and I couldn't answer it. And then I kind of looked into it a little bit. I said, ah, I get it. So that somebody might ask you to say, well, where? Because you know we're going to be living, and if he's starting judgment, how do we stand in front of Christ? We're going to be taken up, you know. In front of Christ and judge like the wicked, you know, because the wicked is going to be judged during the thousand years, right? Yeah. And then when he comes, so what? Where's that time frame when he judged? So there's a verse in Romans eight one. Romans eight one. So no zombie. What does it say? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay, this is a really good verse. There is no condemnation. Right? Meaning, what's uh, what does condemnation mean? Condemned, right? Mm -hmm. There is no condemnation. You're not going to be condemned. You're not going to be, right? What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? Just, so, just find the word of the word. The word of the word? Mm -hmm. So, condemn. Condemn means you're not judged. You are not um judged to put to death you're not condemned to death you are not uh um labeled condemned meaning you are going to be put to death that's what that means so there's no we're, there's none of that right to those who are in christ jesus under the umbrella of jesus christ so if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing you already judged jesus said check check angels are looking go they're trying, they're failing, they're trying, their heart is in the right place, right? Just check. The judgment's there. He opens the books and the angels come up and say, oh man, Nozomi, he's been doing so great. I know he failed in a couple of things, but oh my goodness, he's just gotten red up again and he's doing everything else. Look, it's all wiped out. Jesus wiped off his sins. It's like a blank page. There's nothing there, right? It's, there's no condemnation. It's, you're already judged. You're already in the book of life. Right. So, you know, this is why we have to keep analyzing yourself. What did we do wrong yesterday? What did we do wrong last night? Did you ask for forgiveness in your heart that you don't want to do it again? Or you'll try not to do it again. Right. And just never give up trying. It was difficult for me and my mom. You know that my mom and I butted heads a lot. She was very stubborn. Right. In her ways which, you know, I appreciate because I know a lot, you know, she's, you know, she's in that generation and stuff, right? And then, so sometimes you get in fights and everything else. And I'm just like, Lord, help me do better next time. I can't fight with her. She's my mother, right? And I know she loves me. She would do anything for me, right? And then, so, you know, I would try again. I said, Lord, give me another chance. Give me another chance, right? And every single time God gave me another chance. He, he knows my heart. He knows I'm trying so hard to get along right? But sometimes it gets difficult, right? But he will help you throughout the, the process. And he knows your heart that you're going to continue to keep trying, right? That doesn't give you an excuse to say, okay, well, God will forgive me, so I'm going to, you know, I'll let it go. You have to really feel sorry in your heart for what you've done. If you lied, you said something bad about somebody, you have to feel it in your heart, right? Um, okay, Let's see. Okay, so that was phase one. Phase two, millennial. Millennial judgment. Millennial judgment. Thank you. Okay, so 1,000 year passes. Jesus comes, and then there's this 1,000 years, right? There's this 1,000 years, right? Uh, and what happens during this 1,000 years? How much time do I have? Okay, I'm running out of time. It's okay. Um, how much time, what happens during this 1,000 years? Okay, open your Bible to 1 Thessalonians, New Testament, 1 Thessalonians, whose turn is it? 
Zoom, zoom. Or did you just read? I just read. Okay, so show. Sure. Ah, why are you lying? <laughs> First Thessalonians 4. Thessalonians 4. Yeah. Can you read 13, 14, 15? And um, Shinji, can you read 16 and 17? Oh. Wait. First Thessalonians 4, 13. 14 and 15. Uh, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, uh, brethren, <laughs> yeah, brethren, uh, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will now will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Uh, that we who uh, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud of, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, so this is a beautiful thing, right? He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I, I want you guys to know this. I don't want you to be ignorant about this, right? For those who have fallen asleep, those who have passed away, like my mother, my brother, right? Um, it says, because um, if you don't have this hope, you're going to feel sorrow, like those who don't believe in Christ, right? Those who don't believe in the resurrection, once they're gone. That's why, you know, in funerals, for those who don't believe in Jesus, they're in agony, they are so much in agony, right? But I was able to handle my mom and my brother because I have this hope that I'm going to be able to see them again. And God's timing is perfect. Now, you have to have that in your mind. Believe it or not, what was even as bad as my family was my pets, right? I had three or four cats that were so dear to me. They were like my children because I don't have kids, right? And when they passed, Oh my goodness, one fell off of the balcony. I was in shock. I didn't eat for five days. That's why I'm in shock, right? The agony that you feel when you lose someone is intense. But if I didn't have that belief, it would have been worse, right? So if I didn't have that belief that God knows better, then it would have been worse. I know my cats died, but I have these beautiful three cats now, right? God will replace it with something, right? Something good. So losing a pet is one of the hardest things because they're innocent. You know, you take care of them. They sleep with you. They're, they're not like your brothers or sisters. They don't argue with you. They're unconditional love, right? <laughs> but losing, losing a pet is devastating, right? It's a part of the family. But then, you know, it's I didn't get another cat to replace it. Exactly. But I got another cat, which gave me some something else to hold, right? And it was more like I said, I'm never gonna get another cat again after my last cat. I right? I just said, never again. I, I it hurt too much, right? Okay. And then I was looking around. It was so quiet. I didn't see things running around anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to pet anymore, right? I didn't have somebody meowing for food or you know meeting me, right? And then so I got one, and I told Jeff. I need another one. And so I got another one. I said, and Grace, she goes, did you get three? I said, I'm going to get three. And then I ended up getting three, right? And then I have so much joy with these three cats, right? But, you know, God will always be there for you, right? And it's not replacing it to replace. Nothing is going to replace my buddy, right? But these cats, they keep me busy. They keep me occupied. They keep me, they make me happy. They bring me joy, right? So, and you got to think about it. I gave them, I spoiled them. I gave them the best life that they could ever have. So they had a happy life, right? So as much as you may lose a pet, you just give them the best life you can. And then when, when it's time, God knows the time when it's going to happen. It's going to hurt. 
but that's a time where you know you think about okay, I need another one, right? I need another one, not to replace, but just to have that companionship, right? Okay, so it says here, what happens to the righteous living in the dead? It shows that Christ is willing to give us a second chance so that we will always be with the Lord, right? So it says, don't be ignorant about those who died, right? Um, uh, but, but Lord himself would descend from heaven with the shout of the Lord. Voice of Archangel. Okay, let's just keep going. Um, so during the second phase of the judgment, the thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. Revelation 24 to 6. Uh, Chloe, do you want to read that? And then Revelation 20, oh. verses 4 and 6. And then Jewel, if you want to get ready, First Corinthians 6, 2, and 3. So 24 to 6? Uh, 20, yeah, verse 4 to 6. All right. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years okay so this one thousand years can you imagine the books are open and all the righteous. So the people who were in Christ was raised from the dead, right? And those are who are still living when Christ comes. They're all together brought up. So I'm going to be with my mom. We're going to be all raised up, right? And go to heaven, right? And then during the thousand years, the righteous is seen if asking, did God judge rightly? That's a big question. Did God judge rightly? That's what's happening in the thousand years, right? That's a picture. So, uh, Jewel, keep going. First Corinthians 6, 2, and 3. Um, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be, will, will be judged by you, you are unworthy to judge the smallest matters. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Okay, so we're going to be judging angels. All those angels that fought back against God. All those angels who are, who tempted you, who brought you to the wrong side, who made you fight, who made you do all these things, all these angels that were doing these things, bad things, we're going to be judging them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what it says right here. God, again, is transparent. He's going to make you see everything. He's going to show you what those angels did to make you do stuff like that. There was a, a Jeff got really upset this week because something happened, right? And I, I kept thinking, it wasn't really Jeff. It was the situation that Satan put him into that made him do what he did. He was get angry. So Satan's going to put you into all these, his angels is going to put you into all these situations to make you fall, to make you not trust God, make you do things that you shouldn't be doing. These are all the things that you're going to be seeing that God's going to show you. He said, angel number 100, 1,150, that shows angels. Joe, look at what he did to you. Yeah. <laughs> right? Every time that you do something bad, you know, she got, <laughs> yes, I got him. I got him. I got him getting angry. Yes, keep going. Keep getting angry. You know, keep fighting your parents. You know, they're so happy when you don't do what you're supposed to be doing. At the same time, you got your guardian angel there fighting for you. Wait, that <laughs> yeah, that two sides, right? Fighting for you. So you leave him alone, right? But if you don't give an effort, 
that guardian angel is gonna have is gonna be weaker in a sense where you're giving more. Remember, you said um, that Indian uh, Geronimo was it Geronimo? Oh no, it was the it was the, the one I was telling you about. I can't remember. And he was the Indian chief. He oh. said he had a, he always feels like these two dogs are fighting inside him, right? And they asked, "Well, who's winning?" He goes, "The one that I feed, right?" So if you feed the wrong things in your life, okay, that's going to get stronger. And the same thing, you're going to have your the angels fighting for your soul, making you do bad things and wrong things. And then you're going to have the good angels. But if you keep feeding that angel, it's going to get stronger and stronger. And it's going to be harder to fight off. Does that make sense? Okay. But God is merciful, right? He's always going to give you a chance. And so there's that judgment. Um, now, during the millennial judgment, where's the wicked? So we're, we're looking at and we're judging the angels and everything else, right? Where's the wicked? They're dead, right? That's the first step, right? So they're in the first step. There's going to be two deaths, right? And hopefully we're not going to be part of the second death, right? The first death, they're going to be all destroyed when Jesus comes because his brightness is just going to destroy them, right? His brightness of his love is just going to destroy them, right? So they are, and it says, Revelation 20, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished, right? So that's the first, this is the first resurrection. Revelation 6, 14 to 17, the sky receded as a scroll. It's rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. This is at the second coming. It's like, oh, huge, right? The mountains are moved out of its place. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, right? The mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in the caves in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains of rock, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great city of this wrath has come. Who is able to stand? So all those who rejected Christ, all those who made fun of you when you said, listen, there's a judgment coming. I want to help you. And they laugh at you. They scorn. They're going to be saying, hide me, throw the rocks on top. Why didn't I listen to Shinji when he was trying to tell me, right? All of these things are going to be happening, right? And what's interesting, he says, the wrath of the lamb. Have you seen a lamb? Have you ever seen an angry lamb? The wrath of the lamb. What does that look like, right? <laughs> you don't see the wrath of a lamb. This describes God's character in Jesus, right? Jesus is gentle. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. So the wrath means when the wrath comes, he will destroy it doesn't mean that he's going to be happy about it. When he has to destroy his own cre creation, right? The people that he tried. Look at what happened with Jesus. He said he looked at Jerusalem when he was on the Mount of Olives just before he was crucified. He wept because he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city where I wanted to, you know, I wanted to put you under my wings as a chicken holds her hands, right? And he wept. That's what's going to happen at the end times. He doesn't want to do this, but he has no choice because he doesn't, he can't bring sin into heaven anymore. Look what happened before. He has to destroy sin forever. It's like the virus. The virus has to go completely, 100%. So it can't infect anyone else. And that's why he has to do that. There has to be a cleansing, you know, the sanctuary cleansing. There has to be a purifying, a cleansing of the earth cleansing of sin so there's no more sin right so that's what has to happen okay so um the final part is the execution when does that happen revelation 20 11 to 13 how much time do i have oh i'm over time okay i'm gonna quick, quickly quick, quickly read uh revelation 20 11 to 13 so then i saw a great white throne and him sat on it from whose face on the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and i saw the dead small great standing before god books were open so here it is the wicked great and small the books were open the wicked are being judged right mm -hmm. and then so the time comes they're all raised 
right? The dead are raised and they're ready to fight God again. Satan goes around and he's ready to fight. And right before then, the books are open and everybody sees everything that they've done. And it says everyone kneels. Everyone knows God is fair. The whole universe knows that God is fair. Mm -hmm. And after that point, they keep trying to win and fire comes down and destroys all of them. But there's so much more, but anyways, okay, I'm out of time. They're gonna make me leave. Um, so let's have a quick prayer. Dear Spirit and loving Father in heaven, thank you again for this amazing lesson. Help us never to give up. Help us to keep fighting um, for. Okay, amen. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, these are just. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, and uh, I guess uh, uh, happy Christmas or Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Church. 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 Welcome to I would like to extend a warm, uh, warm welcome to all of you at the church and uh, those who participate online. Okay. Um, yes. Konaida no desu ne, nichiyoubi ni desu ne, hishashibu ni Christmas kai, ne, ano, idenburi ni in person de okonaimashita kedo mo, honto ni minasan ni to oai dekite honto ni ureshikatta desu. Uh, and it was great, uh, great to see you all at the Christmas Fellowship um, uh, this past Sunday. And uh, after, after the, yeah, after a long absence, mada desu ne, ano kono corona no kansen tsuite masu no de, ma konsh, ato wa konsh matsu ni ano kiko ga aktenko de naka naka izen no yoni desu ne. Um, yes, with the uh, ongoing COVID outbreak and uh, bad weather like this weekend, uh, we are not able to gather at church as often as uh, we used to, but we hope to have more time to fellowship with you in person again. Hi. あの、今日のですね、今日が発表をしていきたいと思います。はい、オッケー。え、we after that, we have a prayer meeting from 2 30. And, of, and uh, okay, Lily, uh, we're going to have a share talent. Uh, you just, uh... yeah. So I know it's very cold out, but I kept praying that it's not like last time. <laughs> so I know everyone's busy, so uh, I don't expect uh, very many people to come, which is fine. Um, but whoever wants to come, uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, but we do need people to help us put packages together. So we got some stuff together downstairs. So if you could help with that. And uh, we'll be going out after we eat lunch. And um, 
yeah, the weather's going to be fine. <laughs> it's fine. We're Canadians. We could handle this. So I figured, you know, the colder it is, maybe there won't be many people going out. So, you know, people really need something right now. So um, we'll be going out today. Thank you. はい、えー、ですね、えー、ちょっと今日少し寒いですけれども、おまあ、ちょっと参加する方も少ない、まあ、かもしれませんけれども、行きたいと思います。えー、まだできる方は、ね、ちょっと行く前のです、ね、パッケージを用意するという、準備するという、下でちょっとやりますので、えー、その準備の方をお手伝いいただければと思います。そして来週ですけれども、今年最後の礼拝となりますが、ですね、戦争生産式がございます。And next week,、uh, uh, last Sabbath worship this year, we will have communion service.、Uh, ぜ,ぜひですね、皆さんご準備をいただければというふうに思います。はい、えー、そうですね、えー。とりあえず今この発表はそのぐらいですけれども、あとプレイヤーリクエストの方。ですね、ちょっと行きたいと思います。Okay, so for prayer requests,、uh, we're、uh, very thankful、um, for Melissa and baby Eli to be coming home. And we saw the pictures on Facebook, so they look so beautiful and we're so happy for that. So we're grateful for our God for taking care of them. We're also thankful for the Christmas fellowship last week, for all the volunteers that came in and everything that. Went together so well, and we're so thankful for that. As well as the shelter run we did last week was、uh, very、uh, black, was a blessing. So we think we're so thankful.、Um, and last week we saw Andrew, which was,、uh, which was amazing. So、um, we were able to see him, and we continue to pray for him and Grace.、Uh, we pray, we're also praying for Evelyn's、uh, brother who passed away as well, too. So please keep them in your prayers. Uh, Krogan's are traveling、uh, to the States. So please continue to keep them in your prayers. They're returning in the new year.、Um, so please keep them in your prayers as well as shelter run for the weather and to be able to reach those who need it the most.、Um, and of course, the church initiatives. And there's some people in our church that are going through some physical ailments. So please、uh, pray for them as well, too.、Um, and then we have a lot of other requests like Bella. Um, who is、uh, going through cancer.、Um, every、uh, Wednesday we're meeting with her, so please continue to pray for her. Tomoko's mother, Brother Neil, George, Rosa, Eriko san, there's so many, Lord,、um, that we're so grateful for your prayers,、uh, consist consistent prayers. Thank you. はい、ありがとうございます。えー、たくさんのね、祈りの課題がありますけれども、えっと、メリサさん。ですねえーとですね、無事に赤ちゃんが生まれて、そしてあの家の方にですに、ね、昆虫戻ってこられたということで、えー、お母さん、メイサさんとまた赤ちゃん、えらい君の、えー、またこの健康を守られるようにです、ね、お祈りいただきたいと思います。また、えー、先ほども話しましたけど、クリスマスのフェローシップ、えーえー、この間、日曜日、2週間前できましたことを感謝します。そしてシェルタランもね先週できまして、何いろんな方にまたお会いすることができました。で、あの、えっ、ー、と、アンドリューさんがね、車してずっと横に来られるのをね、えー、偶然に会ってですね、まあ、いろいろこうお話しすることができたこともですね、本当に感謝です。はい。えー、またですね、えー、そうですね、えー、エブリンさんの方ですね、えー、ご兄弟の方ですね、えー、亡くなられたということで、また覚えておいていただきたいと思います。またね、いろんな外に行ってらっしゃる方ですね、えー、いらっしゃいますし、また今,、えー、今日のシェルターラン、えー、そして、えー、本当に多くのまた祈りの課題がたくさんありますけれども、調法が悪い方のためにですね、お祈りいただければと思います。ちょっとね、マイクの調子が悪いんですけども、スイッチしますか。はい。電池は新しいんですけどね、ちょっとなんか調子が悪いかもしれません。はい、えー、ありがとうございます。えー、以上でしょうか。えー、so、uh, thank you so much、uh, for everyone being here today. So we'll now take、uh, maybe five minutes break、uh, to start our worship service in maybe eleven thirty seven eight. はい、えー、Please、uh, prepare for our worship service. 
はい、あとね、5分ぐらいしてですね、礼拝始めたいと思いますので、皆さんどうぞ、祈りのうちに準備をいただしていただければと思います。よろしくお願いいたします。ありがとうございます。